for our first presentation, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, two speakers, Richard Sherman One, two, and three, Aaron four, Benningfield. Five, six, seven, uh, Richard eight, is a senior uh, Tata Fellow at uh, Tata Consulting Services, okay, great. Thank Center you. of Excellence. Uh, he's the author of the book, Supply Chain Transformation, Practical Roadmap, Roadmap to Best Practice Results. He provides insight, guidance, and training uh, to companies in the area of SCM strategy, segmentation, and performance improvement. He's a founding member of the Supply Chain Council and a leader in the development of the SCORE model, which many of us teach and, and, and talk about in our classes. Uh, Aaron, ba uh, Aaron Benningfield is a blockchain and supply chain strategist at TCS. He has developed expertise in communication, presentation, project management, IT. He's been with Tata Consulting uh, for over five years as blockchain and supply chain strategist. Uh, many of us heard about technology in its role in monitoring, and I think, uh, I think, I think if things work out right, we're going to hear how to protect the flowers in this presentation. <laughs> so Richard, take it away. Thank you, Anand. OK, so good morning, everyone. Let's you know, see if you're all still awake. It's great to be here. Wonderful to be at Purdue. Um, I haven't been on the Purdue campus in 50 years. I happen to go to a little Catholic school up the road and grew up in northern Indiana, and so it was kind of a family feud. Uh, my, my father went to Notre Dame, I went to Notre Dame, my sister went to Notre Dame, my son went to Notre Dame, and uh, I've got uh, five grandchildren, one of whom will probably end up at Notre Dame. On my mother's side, her brother went to Purdue, his son and daughter went to Purdue, their children, one of their children went to Purdue, so we've grown up with this mutual respect and at the same time betting attitude between the two universities. So, uh, so it's a real pleasure for, for me to be back here. Uh, I will say this, the last time I was here, as I mentioned, was 50 years ago. I was sitting in the Purdue section of the Notre Dame football game and the Purdue alumni slammed me for 59 minutes and they were winning seven to nothing throughout the entire game. In the last minute, my roommate forced the fumble at the goal line. The ball ran into the end zone, and one of my other friends jumped on it for a touchdown. <laughs> we went for two and one, eight to seven. So it was, you know, that, and that was the year that broke the six-year streak where Purdue beat Notre Dame six years in a row with Bob Greasy and, and Mike Phipps. So it's, it's kind of a, a fun to be here, and happy to see you all, and, and thank you, uh, uh, to the professors for, for inviting us to speak. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the technology behind uh, supply network collaboration, and then Aaron will talk to you about the technology that, uh, according to Dr. Iyer, is going to save the world. So one of the things I did when I was getting prepared for this is, I, you know, I've been talking ethics and supply chain for many, many years and never really thought of it as a, a segment. Uh, last year, um, Loyola University Supply Chain Management Review, Peerless <coughs> Research Group, and APEX uh, actually conducted a study uh, on ethical supply chain management. And what we found is it is extremely important and top of mind. Uh, so across industries and across functions, uh, people are really looking at ethical supply chain management very strategically and very seriously. On the other hand, the adoption of ethical supply chain management practices is not necessarily leading the thinking on how important it is. So the difference between how important it is and how we implement it uh, is pretty significant. And one of the reasons for that is ethical supply chain management is not just child labor, not just conflict minerals. There are a tremendous number of business practices and issues that supply chain professionals have to deal with on a basis. And what this slide really represents is it's not a simple situation. It's highly complex. We talked about the number of suppliers, the tiers of suppliers, the complexities of a supply network. And then when you think about all of the ethical considerations and environmental considerations that you have to make, it, the complexity can be overwhelming, 
And I would state that the complexity, the cost, and the compliance are the three main barriers to pervasive adoption of ethical supply chain practices, uh, not to mention the fact that the whole separate topic is on how do we resolve value differences? Because what we find is certain countries value different things in different ways. So for example, I grew up in an environment where child labor was not only accepted, it was mandatory. My parents lived in a post-depression era. Everybody worked. You know, so when I was, I think, 13 or 14, I was delivering newspapers every afternoon, earning and contributing to the family income. Okay, when I was 15, I got a work permit to work in a local grocery store. When I was 16, I got a permit to work in the quality control labs of a chemical company. When I was 18, I was able to take a position as a chemical operator in the chemical company. And by 20, I was working in you know, East Chicago Harbor, Indiana, in the steel mills at Inland Steel as a lid man on a coking oven, which at that time was considered the third worst job in the world by the Wall Street Journal. And I was only 20 years old. So is that a child labor violation? So in a lot of countries, children have to work, have to support, and have to be able to contribute to the family income. And so just as Dr. Iyer's example of what constitutes slave labor, what constitutes the value in child labor is a debatable question. So that's another big issue that we're faced with. So in summary, when I talk about ethical supply chain management, it is a component and passive driver of strategic sourcing. It's one of the absolute key questions that has to be asked before you decide whether to take or onboard a supplier. It's comprised of ethical business practices, corporate social responsibility, performance management, sustainability, regulatory compliance, and risk management, both financial operations and brand. And Dr. Iyer did a great job of talking about that. Proof of compliance and audibility is a major problem. Supplier life cycle and relation management are major applications that many companies have already implemented from a technological perspective that really form the foundation of being able to comply with ethical standards and values in your supply base. Supply network collaboration begins with onboarding suppliers continuously monitoring, auditing, and improving <laughs> operational compliance. Social media monitoring is a critical component to identifying problems in the supply chain before they occur. Master data management is foundational. So as you define your value drivers and your value requirements, as you define how you want to certify suppliers, the capability to identify all of the digitalization or digitization opportunities to automatically collect data, automatically communicate data, enter data once. All of that is foundational to being able to support the technology that's going to be necessary to comply, comply with more and more regulatory conformance in the future. And then supply management technology is required for managing, as I mentioned, complexity, cost, and compliance in order to facilitate collaboration. And when we look at collaboration, it has traditionally been a one-to-one -one transactional environment. It's traditionally been someone picking up the phone, talking with suppliers. It's traditionally been focused on the business transactions within a very complex network. Well, when we talk about ethical supply chain management, we're talking about a lot of soft stuff, a lot of documentation, a lot of certification requirements that are non-transactional. And how do we collect that automatically? How do we manage it? How do we monitor it? And so when we look at the transition from traditional collaboration to more supply chain and collaborative ecosystem collaboration, we're really looking at an end-to-end -end network. We're looking at social media and network collaboration. We're looking at integrated supply management across that entire network. And we're looking at analytics-based trade-offs in the supply chain and improvements. So the value drivers and the whole notion of what a supply chain is and how it's managed changes. We are no longer a supply chain. We are no longer a linear communication of information. We are a networked organization. And in, when we look at a complete market, we are a network of networks. 
where every participant, every node in that network is possibly a different organization or certainly a different function, and how do they interact with one another to cause change and influence change in the environment. So what we have to begin doing is thinking about technology not from a linear transactional perspective, but more from a nonlinear system perspective, and how does information flow across the entire ecosystem from your core basic supply network to your enabling network, which is customers, customers, suppliers, suppliers, and then into supporting networks, such as government authorities, licensing, industry standards, banks, credits, settlements. So the entire ecosystem has to be considered when we talk about the movement and auditability of information and data required to comply. And so, as Dr. Ayers mentioned, I was one of the founders of the Supply Chain Council and development of this first SCORE model. And while we focused in on developing a process standard for an internal organization, source, make, plan, deliver, uh, return, and enable, our real intent at the time was to be able to take an enterprise map process map and map it to our customers and to our customers' customers and map it to our suppliers and our suppliers' suppliers so that we could create a continuous flow of information and data in an end-to-end -end process environment. And so if you want to embrace the SCORE model and use that as your guidepost for mapping out what digitization and digitalization are, and there, there are two different things. Digitization is the conversion of physical information, such as papers, work orders, and things like that, to a digital or electronic state. Digitalization is taking that data and applying it to automate processes and being able to support information and material flows across the supply network. And so it's very important to understand that. SCORE gives you the capability to define that. So when we look at collaborative supply networks, we're looking at totally different technologies than we're traditionally thinking about. It's much more value-oriented than transaction-oriented. It's much more network-oriented than chain-oriented. And it's got to be immutable, and it's got to be uh, auditable. And with that, what I'd like to do is introduce Aaron to talk to you a little bit about blockchain technology and how it can be applied to the auditability, immutability, and capability to connect enterprises in a, in a multi-enterprise network. Thanks, so Rich. Aaron, there you go. All right. Okay. So uh, interestingly enough, we talked about ethical supply chain management, and Rich called me, I guess somehow he heard that I was a blockchain guy and what I had to show. And I said, hey, look, we had performed a proof of concept for the National Sanitary Foundation, NSF, and the scenario that they presented to us in this case, because they wanted to test capabilities, understand how blockchain worked, and give a real world example or scenario, use case, what could happen, is that there was a Nicaraguan coffee farmer. And in this particular case, in Nicaragua, you don't own the land like you do here in the States or Canada. So the actual revenue generation or profitability center was the trees, the crops, or whatever produced that they were going to sell. Second key thing was that because we were selling or using someone from Nicaragua, third world countries, while they are uh, very mobile savvy, so pretty much everybody has a mobile device interacts, uh, they were very technically inefficient. They can't run advanced analytics. A lot of these things that Rich was mentioning has been brought out before. So we had to make it easy for the Nicaraguan farmer to be able to use. Simple interface, easy onboarding, offboarding. And finally, <clears throat> the piece that I'm really gonna drive to here is the need for a consortium. So Rich had mentioned ecosystem. And <clears throat> I'll be talking about this in the next slide or so. But the biggest thing I've seen with my experience and started talking to clients and trying to drive is that uh, blockchain is great, but you can't do these little point use cases or point applications. Because it is decentralized, the trust mechanisms are in the various nodes. You have your computer code and algorithms in the form of smart contracts process the applications distributed. You have to have some kind of ecosystem or consortium model 
that the companies agree to want to participate. Otherwise, you're really wasting your time and you're not getting anything out of the blockchain. So in the POC, as we said, we have Nicaragua and Carter Farmer. We took into the constraints of the ownership is the tree, not the actual land. Additionally, <clears throat> with the farmer having minimal knowledge, having the right interface on the mobile device, we came out with the fact of being able to validate provenance certification of the organic coffee beans and the trees across the whole supply chain. So from beginning to end. I'll show you that next. And again, to really just hammer the point about consortiums and ecosystems. In this particular scenario or use case, we had five actors. We had the auditing body, that would be the NFS. So they would be the setup organization, provide the infrastructure. The thing I want to note about the blockchain is they cannot be the owner. So a lot of times your organizations or companies will have your own databases and systems, and that's a centralized system. You really need to dispense the ownership with the mechanisms, the smart contracts, et cetera, that blockchains offer. So decentralization of trust, et cetera. We had the seed producer, plant producer, nursery, and farmer in this particular case. So <clears throat> not only were we tracking these certifications and enabling auditability through the blockchain, we had another use case, a couple more use cases actually that we could have forward, uh, move forward if they want to. First was tracking the actual coffee bean or the uh, packs, the packages of coffee as it made its way from beginning to seed all the way to the farmer and to whatever company bought the product. Second was, in this particular case, for blockchain, we've heard of Bitcoin, Ethereum, hopefully they'll come back because I have a few that crashed. So the deal was, in this case, because they're remote, we'd have people coming with cash, lots of cash, and a motorcycle and a backpack. So you can all imagine what that happens there, how many palms agrees to Skype, skips off the top and that type of thing. So with the blockchain itself, all the things that uh, Dr. Ayer talked about and we've been talking about perfectly enables this. Information immutability, public, private, Privacy information, so a concern that I talked to a lot of clients, customers about, is hey, I don't, I'm really concerned about private information. Well, this is where building your consortium, uh, setting up a governance, some kind of governance structure, how we're going to develop the strategic business processes, what information is available, has to be considered, because this is long term. It isn't like a year, we're gonna put application and then close it down after that. It has to be long term thought out. Information availability, Nice thing about blockchain is once a transaction is loaded, it can be as little as a minute, it can be as little as an hour. So right now, the lag in information, bulk effect, the supply chain, all these type of things that are currently present because silo information, we can do away with a lot of that. We have the product traceability. So that's the major use case of the supply chain right now, is understanding from the supplier, mentioned cobalt, all the way out to the end product, is in the system. We have user interface with the blockchain. People often ask, how do I interact with the blockchain? And I say, well, it's as easy as this for you. If you have an application, I can do whatever I do like a normal, any other normal app. The heavy lifting, the uh, sophistication of the blockchain is left to like, technology providers and that sort of thing. And finally, electronic asset storage. So <clears throat> another point I'd like to raise here is that we don't store everything in the blockchain. A lot of the electronic packages could get up to five gig contracts, specification documents, et cetera. So that falls back to how do we plan out our strategy for interacting with and using the actual platform and the supplier network with the blockchain. So some key takeaways real quick. Consortium enablement. This is, will, is, this will be the most difficult part of enabling the blockchain and using it because Every company has their particular needs that have to be taken care of. They have their particular strategies. So planning and strategizing will take probably about 89% of your effort. Once that's thought through, then you can start building apps. That's not to say you can do some POCs and testing, but you have to do your strategy and your consortium enablement. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Data provenance. 
The other piece that I see a lot of companies missing is the example of Volkswagen. And this, I always use this. What was it? It was 11 million cars over 10 years, right? And they falsified their information. So we say that the blockchain is immutable. Once the information is there, you can't change it. However, there is massive opportunity for fraudulently changing, altering data in your favor. I'm not saying that anybody here would do that, but it's done. We have to make sure that we have properly accounted for data coming in and out of the blockchain. Technology ecosystem. You see right there, I know blockchain is a great tool, uh, you know, but unlike like everything else, it's a tool. You don't use a knife to screw or bolt down a socket. So that is part of your ecosystem building and what technologies are going to be in place. And actually, how do we optimize its usage? How do we integrate things such as IoT, RFID? Another fascinating topic to me is, on the, I call it icing on the cake, is how do I understand my analytics? What are the machine learning, the big data, the AI opportunities where I can continue to drive out opportunity and new business opportunities, et cetera, competitive advantage. That brings into the case of privacy. So <clears throat> everybody has the concept that blockchain's open or that you can have a fully private blockchain and so you can only have a certain set of participants and there is a centralized control over that. We're seeing the new platforms coming out. Um, Ethereum has uh, enabled the open blockchain, I will call it, and they call it the mainnet, where you have all the transactions, information availability to anybody who wants to see it, as well as an enterprise component to that, where if you want to maintain the privacy of transactions and information among particular partners, you can do so. I think, Rich, back to you. With this left. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> So I'd like to conclude with is basically we've got value-based mod models and digital technologies that have to be combined with ethical supply chain management value-centric approach. <clears throat> and they're shaping the future of ne supply network collaboration. So we've got to look at it from an end-to-end -end ethical supply chain management value focus. We need real-time <laughs> visibility or transparency and auditability. <laughs> Leveraging the data and insights to mine that value. So analytics are only as good as the insights they produce. And so one advice I would give to all of the students here today is, you know, back when I was growing up, there was a movie called The Graduate. And the advice that was given was one word, plastics. Plastics. Well, if I were to give you one word of advice in terms of your career and your future, whether it's supply chain, finance, or anything else, it's analytics. It is all about data mining. And maybe it's called data pumping, I don't know. But uh, data is the oil of the 21st century. And how you refine that data will determine the value that you'll be able to get from it. So joint value creation for economic, environmental, and ethical standards in supply chain is really the future. And I would suggest that you should be developing a supply network collaboration roadmap, incorporating those values uh, into your future. And with that, uh, I'll turn it back to Dr. Iyer. Thank you. <laughs>